Well, happy Friday, everybody. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two, get, two decades of experience as a painter, a craftsman, a restorationist, colorist, a lover of old homes to answer any of your questions live here. Uh, if you're a homeowner, uh, this is a place, uh, if you've ever wanted to ask a professional, uh, somebody who's devoted their life to this trade, uh, any questions, uh, this is the place to do it. Pros, uh, and through the PDCA, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, anything that you pros want to talk about, this is the place to do it here. You can type in your comments below. We can talk about coding science. We can talk about apprenticeship like we're going to do today. We can talk about business, marketing, accounting, uh, business ownership, uh, entrepreneurship, anything else you guys would like to, uh, to watch today. So, uh, this is Ask a Painter 53. Uh, we will talk about apprenticeship today. Uh, out of all the things that I need to solve in my business, this is the one that's going to take the most attention from me. Most of the other things are not solved, but they're to a point where you know they've basically been good for for over half a decade so far. So, but this is the one that I find myself needing that sort of constant improvement all the time, and I don't feel I have it dialed in yet. I feel I'm getting close, uh, but it's something I'm going to improve on. So. Uh, we will start off uh, the P, uh, the winner of uh, uh, my one year anniversary show last week. Uh, I have some brand new t-shirts, we have some brand new hats, we have mugs, we have all this other stuff. Uh, the person who got the winning question was James Gilbert, a &S Painting, uh, Tom's River, New Jersey. Uh, he PM'd me his address, I'm going to send you the entire package. Brand new shirt, nobody's got them yet. Uh, I'm going to send you uh, one of my hats and I'm going to also send you one of the mugs too. So. Thank you so much for the question here, uh, and again, anybody who wants to ask any question, doesn't have to be about apprenticeship, anything, comment down below here, and, uh, and I'll go through it eventually after I get through a little of this. So, uh, and James' question was about apprenticeship this last week, uh, along with a couple other people's too, uh, that, were, uh, that were wondering. I've gotten a lot of questions about this, and I wanted to make sure that I put this in some sort of uh, easily digestible form for you guys here. Uh, I am working on a master's class for other painters uh, about this apprenticeship program here. Uh, I'm going to take a very small snippet of that, uh, a 10,000 foot view, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, just the specifics of it here. So, uh, I understand that sometimes I can be a little bit long-winded on here. I mean, I've gone two hours with a uh, uh, historic restoration consultant. I'm going to try to keep it concise so that if you guys want a quick and dirty overview, uh, we can kind of go over that. So, a couple questions that spurred this on. Uh, Gustavo Ramirez from Lancaster, California. Hi Nick, what's your hiring process when it comes to somebody new to the trade with no experience? Uh, how do you determine if they're a right fit for the crew? Uh, and Shane Sexsmith uh, from Rise Painting in Redmond, Oregon. He also asked, since no one has asked yet, I'll fire it off. What markers do you look for in a new hire? What's your hiring process, background checks, drug tests, uh, anything beyond that? Uh, how did you develop your training program? Uh, okay, well, here we go. Uh, I tried to, uh, I, I'm still sort of processing all this in my head. I'm trying to come up with a, with a very simple way to present this to people, but I basically have broken my process uh, that I've developed over the last 10 years into about four different steps here. Um, number one, <laughs> you have to find them. You have to find physical bodies to get into your group so you can start training them. Number two, you have to indoctrinate them into your culture of your business. Uh, number three, you have to engage them. And number four, you have to give them hope. You have to give them some, some vision of the future that allows them to work as hard as they can and uh, give them some hope that, uh, so they can plan for the future that, uh, you know, uh, so they uh, don't get the impression that they're just hired labor that I'm gonna use up for a season and throw away. So, number one, finding them. Uh, years passed uh, when I only needed a few employees. Uh, and maybe I should give you a, a quick overview of what's been going on. I've had my own business for 10 years now. Uh, I started off uh, for the first year to three years, somewhere in there, uh, I can't quite remember, but I basically just labored by myself. That's the type of business that I grew up in. And that's what I was comfortable with. Wasn't really interested in exploring any other options. It was light, uh, it was efficient. But pretty soon I realized that uh, if I was at max physical output, this is about the best I was going to do. I mean, I was fresh out of the Army. I've never been in more better shape since I was back then. And I knew that it was basically, you know, I would have to work very hard to keep up that sort of production rate. So I started dabbling with employees. I, I picked people I knew. You pick some teachers who are off in the summer. Uh, you pick some young, enthusiastic people. I started with one. Uh, I sort of tried to get the process down, uh, seeing how it works with another person. One was good, so then I added two, 
and then the next year I grabbed a few more and uh, this year we're up to 10. Uh, so this is uh, this has been a very very fruitful summer for me. Uh, uh, before it was always well we just start working and follow me lead by example and do what I do and and it's fine. But now there's so many people there we're starting to find stratification uh, within the ranks of, of my, all my apprentices. So uh, the apprentices that I had uh, um, you know, my, my longest serving apprentices are now moving into the ranks of, uh, of becoming corporals or squad leaders or uh, senior apprentices and now I'm sort of pairing them off with my junior apprentices after I get my hands on them and we're, we're trying out different ways of training here. Uh, I wish there was a system where you could just say here's a flow chart just do this it's fine but as anybody who has employees know it's it's personality driven so depending on the certain wants and needs and characteristics of each apprentice you sort of have to tailor your uh, command structure to that so I thought I'd go through here and uh, basically everybody wants to know how you find employees and I will tell you this uh, sadly I keep coming to this conclusion that whenever anybody asks me about well how do you do this it turns out that super hard work for a long period of time and being consistent is the way to solve every problem that I've encountered in business. That's not a sexy way to put it. It's not a quick way. It's not a cheap way to do things. But honestly, if you want to solve these problems for the long term, do it often, do it early, and be consistent always with this stuff. So I started probably seven or eight years ago uh, dabbling with employees. And uh, you know, I basically just took it from there. I, I told myself I will have as many employees I can handle but quality has to be met. I was known for a certain amount of quality and I never let that slide. So if I saw that having a certain amount of employees slid like this, I stopped, I reevaluated, I retrained, I did stuff. So we always had to bump up against that, you know, quality must be maintained. But the, the biggest way that I've uh, found employees uh, is actually through this online presence here. Um, not only uh, will, will portraying yourself as an expert uh, over social media nowadays uh, get you work, uh, it will also get you employees. Now, there's to me, there's basically uh, two sort of groups of people that I interact with on Facebook. There are my parents' age group, and there are me and then younger. Uh, the people older than me tend to be my clients. The people younger than me tend to be my uh, possible apprentices. So. Obviously, when we're talking about social media, we're talking about Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, it's going to skew a little bit younger uh, as you go. But uh, in the last couple of years, I've noticed uh, the age group uh, significantly get uh, larger and, and the ages become larger uh, on Facebook. So where, where it used to be just me interacting with my peer group or people younger than me, now all of a sudden we're getting people who are in my client uh, base. And, and my clients are largely made up of 40 to 75 year old women and you're seeing a large portion of that uh, portrayed on Facebook at least in my area at least in the circles that I run in so it's kind of interesting uh, interacting with these two groups the benefit and and I've played the long game with this I think I've been doing social media for myself and my business for probably you know eight years eight or nine years now and again do it early do it often and do it consistent uh, I've, I've, I've tried my hardest over the years to, uh, to have a consistent message across here. I, I put pictures of my family, some of my pastimes, and a lot of my work, and I'm hoping that it all becomes this mosaic of uh, a good snapshot of who I am and what I do. Now, the good part is, is that the young people are seeing this, and they're seeing it as a possible uh, avenue for jobs. The older people, people older than me, are, are my clients seeing that, and that's fine. They call me for work, but they also have children, grandchildren, cousins, acquaintances, neighbors, and uh, a large portion of uh, my apprentices now are coming through the web of social media. They're not, very few see me on social media, get a hold of me, and want to be an apprentice. A lot of it is, you know, hey, I, I've been following you on social media for a while. I've seen some of the work you do. I have a son or a daughter or somebody who's looking for some summer work or somebody who just got out of college or somebody who quit college and is looking for something to do and the name gets passed along. Uh, so it's been a very interesting way uh, of doing that. Now, again, this isn't what... I get the feeling that when I interact with other painters uh, in large groups, what they want to say is go to this website, type in this amount of keywords, and magically 100 apprentices will come to you. And it's not that. It's it's extremely long game. And and this last year, I've actually hit the critical mass with, with the growth of Ask a Painter, with the growth of my business site, my personal site. 
uh, it, it seemed to have reached enough people where uh, all of a sudden they're coming to me. I, I kind of put it out there that I'm always looking for decent human beings and it's sort of just known now that, that that's the case where people just send me people or people notify me myself. Now, uh, there are websites that I, I do frequent only to sort of get you know the feel of what's going on out there and I'm also never opposed to one in a million chance of finding somebody decent on things like Craigslist or whatever so uh, websites like indeed uh, have become a large thing now a lot of young people are on indeed and uh, I just put my jobs out there my listings and then you know every morning I get an applicant or two uh, and I just go through them and I see if they work if they meet the basic criteria I'll put them in my to call pile and I and I get a hold of them uh, I do do the notorious Craigslist thing. I have alerts set up on Craigslist. Anytime anybody in my region is looking for a painting position uh, or a trades position, I get a notification. To me, the return on that is about the equivalent of direct mail. If, if uh, one tenth of one percent of it works out, you're doing better than the average. So basically, I never expect anything to come out of Craigslist. Uh, in the past, I've done a lot of digging and mining and refinement and tried to make stuff work. And the return rate on Craigslist is just not uh, not what regular social media is. Uh, nowadays, uh, this last year too, Facebook started jobs posting, which is huge. So through my social media sites, I can make a job posted ad, and through uh, you can boost it, you can not boost it, but there's metrics in there where you can say, I want age group, I want demographics, I want location, and you can zero in your help wanted ads on Facebook, and it's amazing because it's all free and. Uh, you, know, you take all these things in combination and uh, you know eventually people come in because really how many people do you need if you need between one and ten people you know you're gonna get way more applicants over the years if you portray yourself as an expert and be consistent and always just have your feelers out there you know you can't wait till you need an apprentice uh, I have ten now I'm still farming uh, apprentices you never know when people's plans change whether they're gonna go to college whether they're gonna find another job move out of state I always have sort of a farm team going uh, of constantly working with people to get in here so uh, uh, the biggest um, I guess the biggest tip if you can call it a tip that I can give uh, you professionals if you're looking for apprentices is that you have to put consistent time and effort into all these sites updating it but you also have to make it easy for your apprentices to get a hold of you so uh, I have put uh, on my business site a way that people can just click and fill an online application I've also put that on my website too where right right on the front home page there's an apply here section so instead of me contacting these people or somebody gets a hold of me through Facebook say hey I'm interested in working what's it like before I used to have to you know either uh, send them uh, an application send them my uh, criteria sort of things like that uh, nowadays I just say hey go to my website fill this out you within five minutes I'll get their application I'll look at it I'll talk to them and I'll, and I'll see if they're a good fit so uh, make it easy for people to get hold of you and especially with uh, Facebook and Instagram and all this other stuff just make it available for them let everybody know that you're receptive to it and when somebody does put in an application just get back right away because they're not putting in just one application they're putting in multiple and if you're the first one to get back to them and engage them uh, you'll be you'll have first crack at them okay um, I do uh, let's see we did indeed uh, Instagram I put some stuff out there Instagram is more of a, a athletic event for me it's just an exercise and you know putting stuff out there uh, not a great return on Instagram uh, word of mouth is huge uh, and then I still have a newspaper ad uh, in my community. Uh, my demographic, like I mentioned before, is a little bit older uh, for a lot of my work. Uh, the newspaper still has a lot of credibility around here, the local, the very local newspaper here. So uh, sort of having a phone number with a local prefix, uh, having an ad in the paper adds a lot of legitimacy uh, to what I do right here. Now, in five or ten years, probably not going to be the case. But for now, uh, I find great value in it, especially for my demographic. Uh, and I've completely switched all my print marketing now. It used to be, here's the services I offer, here's some projects I did. Everything now is just help wanted ad. Uh, not only does it help me in actually getting apprentices, it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of a not so direct way of saying my business is growing, I have a lot of work, and you know I'm looking for people and people take that as a sign of oh well Nick Nick's doing well and and uh, you know he must be looking for people because there's a lot of work out there so it, it's sort of a two-pronged approach as far as that goes and uh, just making it easy is is huge now um, when I find people I have a very very simple process of uh, figuring out if they're going to meet my criteria they just have to meet with me 
uh, and everything that leads up to there, their communication pattern, how quick they get back to me, uh, how business-like they are, if they're on time, if they're dressed well, they just have to talk with me. The, the online or the application for me is just a way to weed out the people who are just fishing. I honestly don't use the application for much. It's information that I end up filing with their packet if I do hire them, but honestly, if <laughs> I can weed out half the people who get a hold of me looking for a job just by saying, here's an application, fill this out, get this back to me. As soon as I get it back, I'll call you and we'll talk. Half the people won't even fill out the application. So that makes my life easier. If they're not even serious enough about going online for three minutes and putting in their own information, they definitely don't even meet the, the basic bar to, to getting on a team and apprenticing under me. Uh, when they do get it back to me, they just have to meet with me. People think it's very important uh, you know, to fill out the right words on the application for me or, or do the right things, really. They just have to sit down with me, and if in 10 minutes uh, they sort of seem trustworthy, honest, I ask them a lot about their past, a lot about what they like, what they don't like, and sadly, again, it's not a system. From doing this for so long uh, and uh, just sort of being a student of uh, psychology and, and, and human interactions, you can really, really pinpoint, and, and you notice patterns uh, when you interview people uh, that, you know, sadly, it's not it's not a questionnaire, uh, uh, an emotional quotient test that I can give people and say, well, you met the basic standard. Uh, I, I, I really have a feel, uh, at least specifically what my business wants, just by talking to these people, and, uh, and depending on, you know, what they... What they say and what they do uh, depends a lot, and uh, a lot of the times I give people uh, I give people the benefit of the doubt, and uh, you know if they if they meet all those basic criteria, I'll give them a shot. And uh, I'm always very upfront with them that we basically have a week or two period where it's sort of a trial. And uh, you know if if you don't like it, that's fine. We'll just shake hands and walk away. Uh, but I just know that uh, that first two weeks it's going to be brutally honest with you. And uh, if you don't meet the criteria, you either fix it immediately or you go find something else to do. So. Uh, when we finally get an applicant uh, and somebody that I think is is deserving of a shot, uh, one thing I'd love to do is basically tell them, you know, I, I ask for a list of demands. What's your schedule going to be and how much you want to make an hour? And most of the time, people don't ask for anything outrageous. So my first sort of... Uh, my first sort of offer of trust, you know, from, uh, from a, uh, an employer, a boss, a teacher, is to basically say... If you don't ask for anything crazy, I'll give it to you. You know, I, I want that first interaction. I don't want to be trying to put the clamps on them right away and get things from them before they've given me anything. So I just basically say, what's your schedule? What do you want to make? And, uh, you know, if they, if they don't ask for anything outrageous, we start uh, and we kind of just go from there. Uh, the second part, once you get somebody there is, and, and if I'm skipping over anything or if anybody wants me to elaborate, certainly just uh, type it in below here and, and we'll get to it. The second part is indoctrination. Uh, immediately when they get on my team, uh, you know, I buy them all the uniforms. Uh, I send them down to one of the local paint stores and they, they put some pants, some shorts, shirts, sweatshirts on, on my account. I give them some hats. I, I buy them a white jacket, things like that. I want everybody looking sharp. Uh, you know, being in uniform uh, is, is the first step of becoming you know, that you think a little bit differently when you show up in brand new white stuff and you see all my other apprentices and you see their, you know, time-worn clothes, lots of colors of paint on it, and it's sort of like, oh, they, they start seeing the progression there and they feel a part of this team, but they also can notice then uh, the, the, appre the senior apprentices, you know, by, by, the, by the paint on their uniforms and things like that. From the first second they interact, uh, we basically, uh, I, I have all my senior apprentices do this too, but it's all business from day one. You must be on time. Five minutes early, 10 minutes early is always right on time. If you are showing up one minute before I told you to, I pull you aside and tell you this is not acceptable because if you're dealing with one minute, uh, my truck leaves at a certain time and if you're not in it, we go and then there's just, you're left standing there and uh, not, no communication after that, we'll deal with you the next day. So um, immediate indoctrination. Uh, we basically, uh, you know, from the second we get in the truck, we, we show up at the job site. I, uh, when time allows, I physically take them aside for a day or two myself, and I basically say, you're shadowing me. 
come with me. Everything I do, you do. So between setting up the job site, laying out drop cloths, uh, looking for tools, getting things ready, I do everything with them to kind of let them know, not only technically this is how you do it, but I want them to feel the pace of what we're doing. Uh, I, I tend to be a fairly quick mover, and uh, if there was any doubt in their mind, if uh, if you know if this is going to be sort of a meandering, lazy sort of easy job, uh, they're they're sadly mistaken right away because you know if they see me doing it right away, there's basically no excuse for them not to follow along. And I found again, uh, there's not a simple command or thing or, or or structure or system you can put in place uh, to train these people. The best way is if this is your business. Uh, and if this is the thing where you uh, that feeds your family, pays your mortgage, uh, you should take it uh, uh, seriously enough uh, to lead by example. Uh, leading by example is the best way I've found to indoctrinate these apprentices into the culture of your business right away, where you know it's going to be weeks or even months before technically they're up to par. But that doesn't mean they can't move quick. They can't be polite to people. They can't have their shirt tucked in. They can't keep a, keep a clean job site. They can't move quickly. Uh, they should be sweating. They should be uncomfortable. You should always be thinking, uh, I should be doing something more. I should be doing something to, to push this along. So even if they don't feel like they're a great technical painter right away, you can get them indoctrinated into the hustle culture of your of your business. So, um, okay, after, uh, after indoctrinating them, um, you know, you basically want to uh, engage with them. There's going to be a period where, you know, immediately within a day or two, everybody snaps into focus. Uh, everybody's doing what they need to, but they just need technical assistance then. So at this point, I either pair them up with one of my senior apprentices and we say, this senior apprentice is going to paint the soffit and fascia. You shoulder to shoulder with them. You guys do it together and proceed. Do what they do. Take commands from them. Just hustle. Uh, and then I, I try to engage constantly with, with everybody that way. Um, I don't have, well, one of the first things I do before we even get painting, I have a formal safety program that I take them through. It's less than an hour long. It's something that I've developed in, in, uh, in conjunction with OSHA and with a bunch of other specific things that I've encountered over the years. And I, I just pull them aside on their first day, their first hour. And we basically sit there and I show them things. We go through some demonstrations of roof safety, ladder safety, chemical safety, eye, ears, uh, you know, uh, respiratory, uh, all different eyes, stuff like that. And uh, we sort of just get them going before then. Um, after that, it's, it's all about engagement. Uh, what I would like to do is then say, hey, now you know how to hustle, follow the senior apprentice, just get to it. I'm going over to work on another project or I, you know, I, it's my estimate day, I'm going on estimates, but I found that that is not a great way to do things. The, the more engaged, the more, uh, the more they see me, the more they work with me, the quicker this whole learning process is. When I had a smaller team, uh, I, I formulated about a two-year apprenticeship program where somebody would not even cut uh, an interior wall for a year before they mastered all this other stuff and uh, I produced very very good apprentices out of this I sorted the gravitas of this program was that they they really had a lot to look forward to and I had steps and lanes where you weren't allowed to do certain things until you mastered others and you know I've modified that quite a bit over the years only because at, at some point you know, I was holding people back from what they were doing. So instead of a two year process, within about two or three months now, I'm turning out what I used to in two years where I just say, if we're cutting interior walls and it's your second day, that's what we're gonna learn today. I'm not holding you back from anything. Instead of saying, I'm, I'm gonna train you in one certain thing for this month, one the next, now everything is job specific where if we're going to, uh, let's see, uh, you know, maybe restore some historic millwork from a church in my shop, I'll just grab one of them and we'll go do it together. And yes, it's very specific. It's not something we're going to do every day. But again, just absorbing the culture and how we do things uh, is just as important as, as the technical training itself. And even though it's very specific, it will translate over uh, into other things. So uh, indoctrination, uh, production rates, uh, quality is another thing too that... I always stress to my young apprentices that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. It's an old army saying where if you do it smooth or if you do it slow, all of a sudden you can make it, uh, if, you do it if you do it slow, you can do it smooth. And once you do it smooth, all of a sudden it becomes fast. And, and this may take a lot of years, it may take only a couple months, but uh, everybody thinks that the only thing they're going to be judged on is how much they sweat. And I really try to tell them that yes, I want you to hustle 
but hustle between moving ladders. Hustle at lunchtime, hustle moving things out of the truck. You don't have to hustle on quality and the actual painting right away. I would much rather uh, have you do something perfectly uh, than quickly. And, and one of the things that I've found, this, this real kind of quirk uh, in almost all humans that work for me is this theory of 100%. Uh, almost without a doubt, uh, you know, the, the example that I give often is, you know, we're starting a brand new house, big, you know, 6,000 square foot estate out there. I'll tell one junior apprentice, remove every exterior light on this building. There will always be one left over. Just for some reason, this theory of 100% is, is something that I find myself, you know, it's not the specific thing of here's how you dip a brush into a can. I, I'm... I find myself finding new and inventive ways to teach this theory of 100% completion of whatever you do, whether it's the single board you're painting in front of you, whether it's unloading the truck, whether it's washing the truck, all of that. If you just do this one task, but do it to 100%, that's way more valuable to me than sort of pushing through stuff and, and missing things. So that's what I found myself um, sort of spending a lot of time on now is, is this, uh, this theory of decentralized command. Uh, instead of me showing up and, and say, take this brush, take this can, you're gonna wanna dip it like this, you start here, you do here, then you do this, that's a whole lot of technical, specific, objective information. What I want people to have is strategic information. So what I do with my senior apprentices now is, uh, we have a lot of people in the senior level, uh, the sort of squad leaders of my ranks, and uh, what I uh, incorporated was a rotating job lead where uh, I give people all the chances. I don't wanna pick out one person and give them all the experience of leading a job. So I take my three or four seniors and I say, well, who had the last job? Okay, so not you, you're, you're do a job. So I give them a little whiteboard. I put the homeowner's name. I put some basic information about the job. Here's the siding, here's the trim, here's the accent color. Here's a few things specific to this job. And then I basically tell them, you formulate a plan and you come up with it and you carry it out. And I will certainly correct you if I see something way out of whack, but you give them ownership of this, uh, of this process. Instead of me saying, okay, I want you to take these three people, start on the south side, do this, they won't understand why. If you tell them we need to start painting this house, what's the best side, then all of a sudden they have to take into account uh, what's the side that needs the most work, uh, how can we play the sun, uh, is it going to be due on the siding? Is this? And all of a sudden they start thinking this. They take ownership of it and they put way more into a plan than if you just dictate all the specific objectives that they do. So this, this engagement phase, this third phase, is basically giving them some type of ownership of this. And uh, I've been experimenting, actually uh, earlier today, uh, I gave one of my apprentices, who's been with me probably for less than 30 days, uh, uh, I gave him another apprentice and I sent him out to a job site and, uh, and sort of let him come up with a plan to do that. And, and certainly I'll query him about this plan and I'll ask him, what is this plan? And I, I'll certainly say, well, that, is there a better way to do it? And then ask him, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm putting ownership on these people a lot sooner than I used to because it makes them engage and, and them having a little skin in the game works a lot better too. So uh, the last portion of this, uh, of this whole process, and this, this takes place on day one too, but is always giving them hope. You have to give them something to look forward to. If you just hire this person and you say, okay, we're gonna paint this house today, they're not looking into the future. They wanna know that you know at the end of three or four houses, we're not gonna run out of work, uh, that there's gonna be something in the future for them, uh, to, to combat this and again to set the, uh, the culture of my company on day one, the second I sit down with somebody and interview them, the first thing I tell them is that whether you're a seasonal employee, high school student, college, whether you're out of work, whether you're in between school, whether you're just looking for something uh, if in the meantime, I will treat every one of you the same. I will treat you like you will apprentice with me and eventually lead under me the rest of your lives. And the training doesn't stop. Uh, when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm starting school in the fall, unexpected, but I really think I should, the training doesn't stop. I don't say, well, have fun, work out your last couple months here and we'll do it. I still give them jobs to lead. I still make sure that I'm training them because you never know if their plans change. Uh, and in return, they see that you're still uh, investing in them. And, and whether or not they stay with you, that's sort of the decent human thing to do to, to another human being. And, and I hope they appreciate that. So uh, I, I mentioned the rotating leads, uh, giving them uh, uh, the whiteboards with all that. I, I want them to know that there is a path to command 
uh, with me here. And the sooner they can demonstrate that, uh, the quicker they'll move up through the ranks. And I always make sure I, I mention to them that, you know, I don't have uh, steps and lanes for pay and all this other stuff. Uh, years and years ago, uh, an employee I had, I, I started everybody at the same rate. It was a good rate, a, a decent rate, but I, I started them all at a base rate. And this employee excelled so far beyond uh, what I what I expected out of them, or what I you know what I expected out of any employee. They started taking command. They started anticipating needs. That I increased their pay 50% uh, 30 days after they did that. And I use that as an example to the other crew that. You don't have to put in your time here. If you're perfect on day one, all of a sudden you start accruing a little bit. And however you produce, uh, the quality and the time and the and the you know uh, production that you do, you'll be paid for that. So letting them know that this is not a government job where you have to put in a certain amount of time, you have to re-interview, you have to meet these criteria. Basically, this is this is carte blanche. Whatever you want to make it, you can. If you want to do your three months in the summer as a college student just to get outside and earn some cash, that's fine. If you want to make a life out of this, you can very quickly too. So letting them know that it's variable like that is uh, is a good thing, and it gives them hope, you know, whether they want to pursue it or not. So I guess the the biggest thing that I've one of the things that I've really tried to instill in my crew, I appreciate context, and. Uh, through the PDCA, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America over the last two years, I've gone to a couple expos, I've interacted with other painters, and maybe maybe they give you good information when you talk to them, maybe not. But knowing what they're doing, how they're doing it, when they're doing it, where they're doing it, kind of lets you know, like, oh, well, that's real interesting, and here's context, here's where I fit into a larger scheme, here's things where I'm lacking, here's things where I'm excelling, and it's good to know, because sometimes you don't know if you're doing something good or bad, unless you see everybody else and what they're doing. So I do the same for my employees, where I always tell them, hey, we did a great job today, uh, we just got done, uh, we finished up early this week, uh, I cut everybody loose, but before I did, I had a quick five minute session, I pulled everybody aside, I basically said, here's what we accomplished this week, here's what we need to improve on. Next week, here's, here's our plan. We have these projects to do, and after that, the next week after that, we have this project. This is exciting. It's something new we haven't done before as a group. Uh, the colors are kind of interesting. And then I basically, you know, I, I extend it out. I say, here's the near-term objectives, but then also here's what the summer looks like. Because, you know, sometimes we get on a run of restoring stucco or decks or something, and they think, oh my God, I'm going to be sanding decks all summer. And I want them to know that, you know, here's what's on my radar, here's what to expect, so they don't think I'm going to be stuck beside, you know, behind this random orbital sander all summer. So giving them context, uh, again, gives them some sort of glimpse into the future and, uh, and lets them know that they're not just, you know, hired hands and, and throw away labor. So, uh, yeah, that's about it uh, as far as that. If, if you guys have any questions specific to that, certainly let me know. Uh, I'm going to go breeze through some, uh, some questions here. See what everybody's up to. I'm gonna have to move into a little bit of shade here. Okay. Shane Sexsmith, thanks for watching. I, I always appreciate it. Frequent, uh, frequent watcher of, uh, of Ask a Painter here. Let's see if I can tilt this guy back here a little bit. Okay. Oh, Chris Shank, the the wise and powerful Chris Shank. Chad Merriam, another local professional here in Minnesota. Thanks for watching, man. Justin Orr, thanks for watching as usual. John Gledhill, thanks for watching again. I do appreciate it. Uh, Andy Schneider, thank you. Okay, so sorry, a little bad reception and an incoming call, so it kind of all happens at once here. Dwayne Battles, thank you for watching. <laughs> Chad, overalls are on point. Uh, like I say, Chad, I'm, I'm preparing. I am a bohemian. A uh, little Czech, little German, little Irish, and I'm preparing for those days when my rear end disappears and my and my gut starts getting bigger. Uh, I thought I'd start breaking in some overalls now. You know, if you've ever seen any old uh, Czech and Bohemian men around, uh, I, I I know what I have in my future. So I'm just preparing for the inevitable day here. So, Dave Hernandez, thank you for watching. Liam Chester, it's always good to see you watching. James Gilbert, a great topic. And if you guys have any. Uh, uh, interesting things that you do with especially apprenticeship uh, employees are one thing uh, I, I don't like the term because you know uh, employees work at gas stations and Burger Kings and apprenticeship is sort of a you will learn something and this is something where you can constantly improve you can do the rest of your life you, and there's always something I mean 
I don't apprentice under anybody. I sort of apprentice under my own conscience. <laughs> when, when I feel I need to do something, it's, it's a constant, constant uh, sort of uh, process of what can I improve. And uh, even yesterday, I got on the line with a bunch of uh, paint scientists and chemists and uh, we had a short conversation, but uh, my intent was to discuss a bunch of uh, molecular science and how little molecules of paint look when they're wet and when they're dry and things like that. So, you know, 24 years into it here, I'm still curious about it. And, uh, you know, the, the apprenticeship never stops, whether you have a master to apprentice under or not. So, uh, James Gilbert, great topic. Thank you, sir. Uh, Don Taylor, you're, you're a little too kind there. I appreciate it. Hannah Brigaman, thank you for watching. Roberto Velasquez, thank you for watching. <laughs> My favorite, Chris Shake, my favorite part of this show is the Minnesotan conversation trans, trans, transition with full accent. Soul. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, the, the wonderful Minnesota accent. I've been blessed with, uh, uh, I got to watch myself when I, when I travel to San Diego for the expo. I get into a lot of conversations where I have to say no. And I, I try to watch myself because it's a, it's, a, it's a little stunning sometimes. It's a little Fargo-ish. So, uh, Paul Schmidt, what, a, what attributes do you look for? in a lead painter uh, and a foreman. Oh man, uh, number one, they have to they have to at least be in attempting to master that 100% philosophy. Uh, there's not many indicators I look for. I would, I would promote somebody who is slow as dirt but does everything perfect uh, more than somebody who misses 5% and, uh, and powers through and does 10 times more work than the other people. So I try to instill that because eventually, again, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. That person in, in the long run will be a much more valuable person than somebody who sort of muscles and, and is headstrong through a lot of that work. So I will tell you what, Paul, and this is super simple, but being on time kills me. It, it is something where if, if you can't master the simple task of being five or ten minutes early everywhere you go you can't be my friend you can't be my employee you just can't we can't interact it's not acceptable to me it's breathing it's sleeping it's eating it's drinking it's being on time it's that's that's not even a low bar that's the basic of basis of life uh, in business so that's to me everything is that uh, so between our interactions on the phone between our interactions uh, in person through the interview I try to set up a way where you know instead of just saying hey I'll call you this week I'll say I'm gonna call you in 45 minutes we're gonna talk then and I call in 45 minutes maybe 40 and and see if they're there if, if they don't answer or it goes right to voicemail then you know okay well there's one check against you you know and uh, but the on-time thing is huge and uh, one thing that I've had to wrestle with I used to fire people <laughs> they'd show up late twice I would just say don't ever come back turns out uh, every young person does this so it's one of those things where um, even my best employees, uh, some of my best employees now have had too late marks against them early on with them. Now, <coughs> excuse me, that's fine. It's going to happen. I've learned to live with a little of that, but don't think I'm not going to lay a guilt trip on these people. I just have to tell them, you know, Think back in all of our interactions. Have I ever been late? Have I ever been unprepared? If I can do it, you can do it. What one man can do, another can do. So this is simple. I'm not asking them to climb a 40-foot ladder, get on a roof, hang from a gutter, and paint something. I'm asking them to physically wake up five minutes earlier than they would have already. So that's uh, I, I really lay it on them. But I will tell you, Paul, that the... Uh, the on-time thing is huge for me, and uh, my best employees have always been the ones that show up 15, 20 minutes early. They get on their phone, they punch in using Time Station, and they start prepping stuff before I'm even at the job site. I'm, I'm 10 minutes early. I'm 15 minutes early. Some of these people are 20, and they get after it early, and I could not click my heels faster when I see that sort of stuff, so I just love it. But thank you for the question. Dave Aldridge? Oh, my old accounting professor from college. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Uh, Juanita, thank you for watching. Michael Harmon, hey Nick, awesome video as usual. As far as your new hires and employees, what's your process for insurance, payroll, etc.? I will tell you that uh, the biggest thing you have to consider between a couple employees and 10 employees is uh, things like work comp, things like liability, all this other stuff becomes an enormous expense or one that you at least have to uh, start watching and project for. When you go, I did a lot of work with my uh, insurance agent, uh, and again, uh, like the last episode I talked about, find a tax preparer, 
find an insurance agent, find a financial planner, find a couple business owners that you can pull together as your sort of ad hoc board of directors and people that you don't just pay to do tasks for you, but pay them uh, and form a relationship with them and then ask them for advice. They're professionals. Just like people would ask me for painting advice, I'm going to ask my insurance guy, what are my biggest threats? What do I need to watch out for? What am I doing too much of? What am I doing too little of? What does 20 employees look like? What does 50 look like? What is just me working? And that gives you that context there. So uh, what you don't want to do is hire 10 people uh, and go about uh, your business doing payroll. You think you're doing everything good. And then at the end of the year, you all of a sudden get a, uh, a uh, work comp audit. Uh, in this case, the audit is not an evil audit, uh, not one of those. This is one where they basically just say, hey, give me your payroll. Uh, let's go through it. Let's see what you paid everybody. And then we need to base our work comp percentage off of that. If you did not plan for that, you will get a, a huge uh, bill at the end of the year for that. So uh, when I was projecting out uh, hiring all these people, I sat down with my insurance person and just said, hey, you know, I, I've got five or six now. What does 10 look like? Let's start setting aside for that so we're not surprised at the end of the year because Lord knows, you know, come middle of January, you don't want to get a bill for $11,000 and uh, you have to scramble to do that. So uh, projecting out things like that. Um, uh, payroll, uh, I use, uh, I've used ADP for a lot of years. Uh, very dissatisfied with them uh, when they started putting automatic price increases on me. They wouldn't call, they wouldn't send a statement. I would just know that, hey, my price rose 15% this year without adding employees. Because obviously, you know, for the checks you send out, the amount of employees you have, the amount of activity, pay periods, it's going to change. But when I have five employees one year, five employees the next year, uh, hours really haven't changed. And, you know, you want to put a 15% automatic sort of surcharge onto me. Uh, I didn't appreciate it. And I, I told them that they took it down. And then the next year they added another one to me. So then I found a local person, which I should have done from the start. And now this, uh, this local preparer, uh, I, I query all the time for information. They've been a great asset to my business as far as, you know, not only tax prep, not only a payroll and accounting, but, uh, you know, as far as planning for the future, you know, what if I bought a building? Uh, what if on my farm here where I'm coming to you from today, what, what happens when we build a house, when we build a barn? Uh, uh, how can we, you know, use this stuff to our best advantage? And they're very forthcoming with information because they want to take care of you. So, um, I would definitely, uh, I, to me, <laughs> to me, doing payroll yourself, I cannot come up with one good reason to do payroll yourself. There are so many things that you have to adhere to, state and federal, that I can't, for the life of me, unless you love doing that stuff, there's no reason you should be doing your own payroll. It is so inexpensive to have a company do it, and they're perfect at it. They will file all the correct things whenever they need to be done. Uh, there won't you won't be uh, messing with your employees your employees will be comforted that they'll know that they're always getting paid what they should be that the allowances are right uh, things like that and uh, yeah I don't know I I've in 10 years I've tried to come up with one reason to do it myself and the filing uh, schedule uh, things you have to send in at a certain time alone is worth it paying somebody and check into ADP uh, get some rates from them check into a local preparer you'll be amazed how inexpensive it is to have somebody make sure you're legally up to standard when having real employees so uh, Michael thank you so much for the question there uh, oh uh, and at least as far as uh, well insurance yeah I, I, I have uh, I have my insurance advisor Jim Callahan we just finished your house uh, today that's where we came from thank you so much for putting up with us Jim's got a brand new baby and he let us restore his house this week so he's a brave man especially when we're crawling over his house at 6 a.m. so Jamie Reed thank you for watching Dave Anderson thanks for watching my friend Shaka Zulu an old army friend of mine <laughs> thank you for watching Chelsea Schindler thank you for watching as well Tom Musel we were just in your neighborhood uh, doing Tukulski's house I uh, hope you enjoyed all the early morning racket that we were making uh, Patty Harriman, thank you for watching as well. Uh, Jesse Krennic, good to see you watching. Parker, uh, my apprentice who, who must have evidently punched out already. I cut everybody loose, he's watching. Uh, Gustavo Ramirez, Parker, if you got any thoughts on being a, a young new apprentice, you uh, type them down below there. Gustavo, uh, thank you for the question this week that spurred on uh, you know a lot of this talk here. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, Freddie Spear, thank you for watching. Juanita. I appreciate it. You guys have a beautiful house on, on the lake there. We loved working on it years ago there. Graham McKay, my good friend overseas. Thank you so much for watching. Danny, 
Uh, great, great cabinet project you recently did. That was uh, that was fun to watch. You're doing some good stuff online there. So, <laughs> Chris, I apprentice under my own conscience. Yeah, maybe I'll have to get that uh, get get that on the new Ask a Painter T-shirt. Forrest Lovely, thank you for watching. Uh, Michael Harmon. And as far as your safety conversation and the new hires, do you have something on paper uh, you could share? And do you have a safety form uh, you have them sign? Uh, I will not share it, only because it's not a legally binding document. Uh, basically, I took uh, OSHA's uh, extension ladder, uh, step ladder, and roof safety stuff, and I, I basically just present that uh, to my apprentices. And I also come up with you know a half an hour worth of super specific things that I do as far as, you know, the big areas are ladder safety number one, uh, chemical safety when we're working with restoration stuff, uh, and just physical bodily uh, safety, you know, the specifics of, uh, you know, ears, eyes, uh, nose, throat, uh, skin, things like that. So um, I want to be as helpful as I can. I don't share this stuff only because it's so specific to my company. It's always changing. And uh, the best thing I can tell you to do is, uh, you know, do uh, go to OSHA uh, on their website, and they have, you know, it's it's super easy stuff. They have a step ladder packet that you can print out, five ten pages. A step or uh, extension ladder packet, five or ten pages. Take what you want out of it. A lot of it has to do with construction, working with scaffolding, tying off ladders, this like that. Not very good for what I do, but I take a lot of that specific just so I have a basis in something uh, to do that. So, Michael, I'd love to be more helpful, but uh, but there's some things I, I keep for my company and. Uh, uh, but I do actually have a formal thing that we go through together, a step uh, thing. We, we talk about it. They sign and date it at the bottom just because I want to have a record of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not assuming that any of this is, is legally binding and would, it would save me from liability in a court unless somebody was doing uh, something very negligent. But it's for my own purposes of, you know, I want them to know, again, on the first hour of the job, this is how serious I take this. The owner of the company pulls you aside and he specifically shows you how to set up uh, chicken ladders on roofs, uh, run a pressure washer, function with your mask on, eye protection, uh, ladder safety, things like that. And uh, if they sign a form and they see that there's a, a process here, immediately they start getting indoctrinated into the system like that. So that I see the value in that, Michael. Matt McHugh, thank you for watching. Steve Thorson, uh, past customer of mine, thank you so much. Uh, Steve, what's the proper way to paint a deck? Uh, what paint is best and what's the best method? Okay, if somebody wants to uh, spend an hour and a half <laughs> uh, doing something, I have an episode of Ask a Painter, maybe three or four back, everything you've ever wanted to know about decks. And you can uh, you can watch that if you like. Oh, got another cabinet delivery coming here. Uh, every Everything you've ever wanted to know about decks is there. Uh, Steve, I assume that your deck is probably cedar, being from our area here. If it's got old stain on it, uh, if it's never been done, basically the, the process goes uh, wash it. Uh, and I like to use a, a simple solution of a uh, little bit of TSP, a little bit of bleach, and some water. Get it on there, loosens up the fibers, gets rid of the dirt. Uh, pressure wash it without harming the wood. Uh, after it dries, uh, you want to wait till about 15% moisture or less. I found that on these nice hot days like this, if there's not heavy dew, usually 24 hours, uh, better even 48 hours of sun, wind, and drying. Uh, you can go and sand it. Uh, I use a leaf blower, sand it off, and then from there, uh, my I, I never use a paint on a deck. Uh, if you want a solid color finish, there is solid color acrylic or hybrid stains that you can use there. They give the look of paint, but they penetrate more. A paint will basically make a rubbery membrane on top of your deck, and as soon as that moisture migrates, you know, from the ground here, it'll bubble up and, and fall off. So basically, uh, my my preferred finish, if you want a, uh, I love the cedar tone decks. Uh, people who've been following my feed here can see that we restored some stuff this week, and we got some beautiful cedar tones. Um, otherwise, there is uh, one of my favorite products is the Cabot Semi Solid. It's readily available. It's inexpensive, and that will give you a, a deeply pigmented finish, which will add for protection. It'll give you a color, and uh, instead of having to do it every year for that clear cedar look, you can do it every two or three years for that semi solid. So, uh, Steve, I hope that helps out. And uh, the Ace there in New Prague has all the brochures and stuff. If you want to go down there and take a look, or or message me, and I'll, I'll give you a hand with that. Uh, Mark Johnston, my good historic restoration friend, who who did the longest Ask a Painter ever. Kale Tomlin, one of my senior apprentices. I guess everybody must be done for the day uh, watching already. Uh, Mark Johnson, simple question. What's your opinion on thinning oil primer? Um, <clears throat> I've experimented. 
uh, with uh, thinning oil primer in the past only to make it easier for my apprentices to work it into barns and other things with very rough wood. It does go on easier. Uh, my concern is always uh, getting enough of a coating uh, to, to cover up a lot of the uh, uh, real rough wood. Uh, if you use um, a standard oil primer at its full thickness, apply it to the wet mill thickness it should, it actually fills in quite a bit of that stuff. And for anybody who's ever seen a barn, you know, one of the historic barns, 100 years old, that's been washed and sanded uh, and sprayed uh, for a finish versus brushed, they look like two completely different boards. The one that's been brushed primer and two coats of top coat all brushed is way smoother. It could be 10 times smoother than something that has just been sprayed, not back brushed, not back rolled. I've even seen some that were sprayed and back brushed and back rolled. They still didn't have, uh, you know, the, the mechanical filling of the, of the rough grain that brush did. So yes, uh, the only time I've done it is when, uh, is when we've, we've really had some rough wood it's been sanded, but it's still very cracked, porous on an old historic barn or something. I've thinned it to, to get the apprentices to get it on there a little quicker. But other than that, I haven't seen any drop off. Um, uh, I've been restoring barns uh, by myself for about 10 years now, and I haven't seen any major failures uh, either with regular strength oil primer or the thin stuff. So <coughs> in the in the old sort of uh, ideas of woodworking, you know, there's there's some there's standard varnish and wiping varnish. Wiping varnish is a thinned down version, and when you finish a piece of furniture or cabinetry with wiping varnish, you just have to do twice as many coats. So for me, that's always a concern of, you know, yes, it might go into the wood better, it might be quicker, but is it doing what it needs to? Um, as a rule, uh, I basically now will never ever thin a paint. Uh, the only thing I will do to my paint, amend it, is to maybe add a little extender, uh, something to give it some open time. And even that, I find extenders and uh, and things that give it open time that are actually components of paint and not just other kind of milky, thin additives. I try to stay as far away from the water uh, part of that as well because I've seen horrible, horrible fading. The more you reduce that uh, paint with water, uh, it'll fade very quickly. New construction here is notorious for it, where they'll put Hardy or LP on. They'll, uh, for the, the painter wants to get by uh, with a little bit less paint, maybe go on a little easier. He'll thin it way down. Within a year, that stuff completely changes color in the sun. So uh, you're, you're ruining the integrity of the, of the film and the, and the pigment in that thing. And paint is formulated a certain way. I try to stick to that within, within all reason. So. Matt Baerbach, thank you for watching. Ron Ramsden, uh, as always, thank you for watching. Tamara Jackson, another local person there, thank you very much. Dave Bastier, thank you for watching. Parker, uh, Parker's a very interesting young fella. I met him at the hardware store years ago, and uh, he's actually a cavalry scout now. He, uh, he went through basic training and is going to college, and he is uh, in the National Guard here. A uh, super high-speed soldier now, but uh, found that your style of commanding Respect versus demanding respect is great leading by example and showing what you expect out of everybody. Well, thank you so much Very kind uh, William. Thank you for watching uh, For safety resources at PDCA check out safe with PDCA. Oh, I completely overlooked that uh, there is an actual series of uh, podcasts and documents and things uh, for uh, formal safety programs through the PDCA. So get a hold of Chris Shank. He's the man with all that. And he'll put you in contact with, with people to help you, or documents, or videos, or podcasts. And uh, thanks for the reminder, Chris. I appreciate it. Uh, Tammy Jackson, do you use outdoor paint for both interior and exterior of a front door? No. Uh, normally, I coat the interior of the front door, uh, whatever the wall paint is, if the people have no preference. Uh, almost all the houses I work on, the door is already painted, so I color code it to the actual wall color to kind of make it disappear. Unless it's a very ornate door, you know, if it's a wood entry door or something like that, obviously. But uh, no, the exterior is only useful on the exterior. Interior of the door, you can get by with interior paint. But thank you for the question. All right, well, that looks like about it here. Thank you for everybody for watching today, and thank you all for the questions. Uh, I'm going to be getting these t-shirts out, especially to James. Uh, can't wait to see, uh, see you in the t-shirt, and uh, thanks everybody for watching. And uh, any other questions, you guys know how to get a hold of me. Otherwise, we will see you next week.